A passionate and outstanding parliamentarian, John Humphrey first served as a senator and then as the Member of Parliament for the St. Augustine constituency for 20 consecutive years. As an MP, he also functioned as a cabinet minister under two administrations. Well established as an architect and designer, for over 40 years he has displayed his creative genius. Born on February 19, 1933, John Humphrey spent his early years in Port of Spain, living in one of the historic buildings around the Queen's Park Savannah. His parents, William Neal and May Josephine, were well-to-do, so as a youngster, John had the benefit of attending prestigious schools both here in swimming and water polo and displayed a natural talent for art early on. Later, he went to Canada to pursue architecture at McGill University. Although he grew up in a somewhat privileged environment, John Humphrey developed a keen sense of social justice from an early age. A streak in him, a strong streak of striving for equality and for alleviation of poverty. And he expressed that, I find, in many different ways. And certainly in terms of, his, um, of the fact that he, he took risks he was, he, he was always brave in what he was doing and he was always outspoken in his beliefs. On his return from Canada, John wasted no time in engaging in the issues of the day. In the 1960s, uh, he, he became part of new, the New World Group. In fact, I should tell you this, that at that stage, <coughs> the New World Group, which was at, at the time in Trinidad, was under Dr. Millet. He was the leader. Uh, we, John made available a little family dwelling uh, building that existed at the corner of New Street and Pembroke Street. And every Wednesday night, I think it was, we used to meet there and talk about the issues of development. And we had people of different walks of life that came to talk about what they had to, what their views were. By the early 1960s, John had developed an independent voice. My first involvement was to try and persuade Dr. Williams and Dr. Capillo to come together. In fact, this was before they went to Marlborough House for the Constitution. And my argument was that if we do not unite our people, we are not going to make the progress that we deserve. By 1966, John Humphrey had become politically active. My earliest recollection of John I, I think was when the Workers and Farmers Party in 1966 was campaigning for, for the elections of that year. 65 is when CLR James was put under house arrest. And I was taken by a friend to meet him in a little house in Barataria. And we had lengthy discussion. And I suggested to him that what he should do is rally the trade union movement, the labor movement, but join with the official opposition, which was the DLP, and not to form a separate party. Because what I argued back then is that you'd split the votes and you'll keep PNM in power. After his brief involvement with the Workers and Farmers Party, Humphrey joined Bastille Pandey in his struggle. The Workers and Farmers Party lost everything, even the deposits. <laughs> I got close to Baz and I helped him struggle in the union. And then we work with the leadership of the, of the workers, the trade union, and we form the United Labour Front. Prior to the emergence of the ULF, the trade unions staged a mass peaceful demonstration which ended in confrontation. Now known as Bloody Tuesday, it remains etched in the minds of activists. In fact, John was involved in that. He was one of the frontliners. Um, so that when the um, police confronted us with about oils and tear gas and guns and so on, um, they held him, beat him up very badly, uh, shoved a baton in his belly and punctured his, his intestines. John was, John was injured very badly. Our, our cry was peace, bread and justice. We were trying to unite Indians and Africans by uniting the All Trinidad Sugar and General Workers Union with the Oil Field Workers Trade Union. So it was, in fact, natural for me to become an ally of Baz and work with him 
and struggle for this unity. In the 1976 elections, um, we displaced the DLP as the official opposition, and I became leader of the opposition and appointed John um, as senator. Uh, because uh, I wanted someone in the Senate who would represent um, the, 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 the workers, the workers' aspirations. In the late 1970s, he also became a strong advocate outside of Parliament. There were serious issues related to squatting because many people could not obtain lands. There's a, uh, something that happens in the society whenever there's an oil boom, whenever there's extra money within the system. Um, the first thing people do to secure their funds is to buy lands. It's about the safest investment, and the price of land will suddenly go up. So you notice that anytime there's an oil boom, the price of land goes up. So poor people cannot access a piece of land to live on, and you know, squatting would escalate. And the response of the administration at the time was to break down people, um, squatters' houses. And Humphrey tried to influence the, the then administration that they ought not to proceed that way, that squatting can be a solution in some, some situations. And um, at, before you break down somebody's house, at least try and relocate them somewhere. These are people, families, children, and so on. So when they broke down the houses, how free to go and build them back up. Also a member of the ULF, Lennox Sankersing was selected to contest the St. Augustine seat in 1981. He recalls how Humphrey entered electoral politics in that year. But when I went into St. Augustine trying to organize a seat, I found that there were a lot of people who were resisting I felt that they needed a more high-profile person to find that seat, somebody who could be more influential. And it was suggested that John Humphrey might be the right person. So that's how we got into St. Augustine. And we captured St. Augustine. We thought we were going to lose it, but we captured it. And then I stayed there for four terms. Although many remember Humphrey for his stand on housing issues, he sees his focus in this way. Always, always finding solutions to end poverty and to unite our people in the process, always. Susulan was based on that and it was very successful because we started it in the very early 80s, just after we, we had come into office. And at that time we had come to the end of the first oil boom where the prices of land had so skyrocketed that not even the middle class could afford to buy land for a home. And we demonstrated with Susu Land that we could take poor people's money, buy land, put some basic development, give it back to them, and they could have their homes. Now, if we could do it as a private initiative, and we have no money, really, we use the poor people's money to do it, why can't a government do it? Dubbed Land for the Landless, the Susu Land Project was one of Humphrey's outstanding innovative solutions to alleviating poverty. There were 17 squatting families um, in the Twin City area, which formed part of the St. Augustine constituency. And um, they occupy lands owned by a large land developer, I believe it was Trinidad Homes Limited at the time. And the land developer obtained judgment against these people, a court order that they have to move out. Um, so they had the tractors lined up to move them out, and so they gave them a day or two to move out. But the people went to their representative, Humphrey. Humphrey came to me as a lawyer. I had my practice in Port Spain, and he asked me to write to the developer, asking them to hold their hands for two weeks so we could find an alternative place to settle them. So they agreed. So we had two weeks. At that time, a strange thing was happening to society. Uh, because of the ERP programs, uh, I call it DUDE at the time, and so on, there were a lot of make work programs, and a lot of people were leaving agriculture and coming out and working these make work programs where they could get. I suppose easy money, you work for two, three hours for the day and you get a full day's pay and so on. And so they shifted. There was this abandonment of agriculture. And many estates were abandoned. And selling, people were selling it relatively cheaply and so on. So Humphrey got the people together and told them, listen, there are so many abandoned estates in the country. If we can, if we can put your money together, small amount, and we can purchase a small estate, um, it's possible that we can subdivide it with minimum infrastructure and everybody can get a separate piece of land and build a house. They agreed and we located a small estate in Coryell Village of 38 acres. However, 38 acres was too big for the 17 families. You know, because some of them only need a half lot or two lots or half acre, not more than that. 
Um, so he told them, listen, invite your friends and families and other squatters, other squatters, people who have land, to join in the process. So people joined them. People came in, more people came in. How do you realize that we had so many people that we had, we had too much? So we asked a few people, quite a few, to take back their money because we could not come there on them. Not a person took back his money, not one. So we asked, well, what do we do? They said, well, buy more estates. It was, that was the beginning. And it really was a, a, a physical expression of, a, a, of a, a political view about development. And there are accidents of history because you don't, you don't know it's going to happen tomorrow. But that's what happened with Susu, the beginnings of Susu land. From 1983 to 1987, the Susu Land Company purchased 10 estates in Trinidad and one in Tobago, distributing over 2,000 parcels of land. Working closely with Bastio Pande in the political arena, Humphrey continued his thrust for unity from the 1960s. In 1986, he was a catalyst in the formation of the National Alliance for Reconstruction. I had always liked Carl. We were always friends. And in fact, when he led the National Tenants and Repairs Association. I got involved with him. And then when I started Susulan, we shared our ideas. So when, when he had lost the 81 election, and I kept hard copy of the results of all the election from the time I was interested, I did the maths and I saw where if the ONR and the ULF had joined forces for that election, we would have won it. Now, the NAR was National Alliance for Reconstruction. We had already, the ULF had already joined with Tapia and with the DAC, and we had formed a little coalition that we call the National Alliance of Trinidad and Tobago. So we formed the NAR, and it was highly successful. But then it didn't last more than a year. In January 1987, John Humphrey celebrated the NAR's landslide victory with a second term as the MP for St. Augustine. This time he was also part of the cabinet as Minister of Works, Settlements and Infrastructure. My concern was physical plan for the country and to shelter our people adequately. And I'd asked my permanent secretaries to come back with an evaluation of how money was being spent in the various divisions of the ministry. And if I tell you the works division of the government, for every dollar spent, I think it was 98 cents was spent in labor and two cents spent in everything else. Now, I had come out of my architectural practice where the worst project that we had undertaken, it was a 50-50 split, 50% 50 labor, 50% everything else, transport, materials, everything else. The more efficient ones was a third labor and two thirds everything else. So when I saw this, I said, no, we can't, we can't excuse the government for wasting the people's money in this way. And I called Robinson and I said, we have a paid labor force. When I checked it, it was about 30,000 in the construction side with 1,200 university trained people. That is a big, big human capital resource. We also have the state land. I suggested to him that what we do is pool the labor that we are paying for with the land that we are managing on behalf of the people and call on the private sector to enter into partnership arrangements with us to develop all his idle land. He asked me if I would head the National Housing Authority with the intention of turning it into a land settlement agency based on the Susulan concept. The, the board, the NHA board, was the first board established by the NAR government at the time. And we therefore set up an, arra uh, uh, an approach that could allow us to take the, the Susulan experience that we had all worked with and developed into a national development approach. Despite the tangible results and the productive period, Humphrey's first stint as a cabinet minister was short-lived. Before a year, I was fired. 
Now, I didn't know why I was being fired because he never told me why. I only assumed that he wanted to get rid of Baz because he wanted to capture Trinidad. All he had was, remember, two seats in Tobago. And he felt the only way to do it, again, use it, the race card. So, fired. I found out why when the Commission of Inquiry into July 27, 1990, called him to give evidence, Mr. Robinson. And the evidence he gave, I was fired for two reasons. That I breached tender rules by awarding con contracts unlawfully. And that I was talking about monetary reform and upsetting the whole business community. I believe, my own feeling, is that um, I think Robinson had, uh, was very angry that um, John was speaking about monetary matters. I do not know if Robinson felt only he should speak about that. Um, and I do not know whether that was the reason he fired John, but I know that that was something of Robinson's score. All right. The tender rule, I didn't breach it. I formed a committee that included the chairwoman of the Central Tenders Board so that we wouldn't have flooding. We had two weeks from the end of the dry season and the start of the rainy season to clean the rivers and the drains to avoid flooding that year, which is what I did. And it's the only year that we didn't have flooding. So I was fired for that. And then what was the monetary reform? He was the, the minister responsible to CARICOM leaders for bringing the Caribbean dollar into being. He was given that mandate. I called him and suggested that I had long considered a way to reform the system. And I suggested that he persuade his colleagues to unify all the reserves of the CARICOM member states and create a Caribbean central bank and create the Caribbean dollars a special drawing right on the reserve. After Humphrey was fired, other ULF colleagues were forced out of the cabinet. The NAR was split and eventually members formed the new opposition. Because of that, our supporters were very, very angry and they established Club 88, uh, which was 1988. And, uh, from Club 1988, of which John again was a part, a very important part, um, the UNC was born. Before the end of the NAR term, in July 1990, there was an attempted coup and Humphrey was held hostage in Parliament. In December 1991, the UNC contested its first general election, winning 13 of the 36 seats John Humphrey returned as an opposition MP. After spending six years in opposition, the UNC won control of the government in 1995 in coalition with the NAR. John Humphrey won the St. Augustine seat yet again and was appointed Minister of Housing and Settlements. So when, when we got into the government, I appointed him as Minister of Housing. And one of our, the planks of our, our, our housing policy, which was again uh, inspired by John, um, was that people should be given land upon which they will build their own houses uh, according to their own style, according to their own finances and in their own time. Um, and that was a great idea. It was a very successful program. The NHA had a very important role to play. Um, we identified enough land areas for housing that are still the land areas that are being used to deliver houses today. And um, what I wanted to do was to establish a land information system. And we had, in fact, communicated with the Canadians who had been very successful. If you have a land information system, all the data on the buildings of the country is in the computer. All electrical lines, all the water lines, all the sewage lines, all the boundaries. And it's very easy, once you have that data, to plan. So we had put together a very strong team, technical people. And we were doing that exercise. And in fact, we completed it. I would say that that 
95 to 2001 was the best government we had under the prime ministership of Mr. Pandey. Humphrey did not contest the 2001 general elections because the leader of his party had other plans for him. It, we, we thought that John would have made a very good president. He, he, he was always so accommodating. He had, he, he had tremendous skills for uh, soothing people who were in anger and so on. And, and, and therefore we thought John would be perfect as, a, as the head of state. Today, John Humphrey is still passionate about national issues. For over 40 years, through his contribution to art, culture, architecture and politics, he has left an indelible imprint on the landscape of Trinidad and Tobago. As an architect, uh, and you are always creating things, you are building things, always. Um, you have to design things. And I thought that John uh, could probably be described as a political architect. That is to say, in the politics, he was always thinking of new ideas. How do you help the poor? How do you create systems, Susulan? How do you deal with this question of money? And he talked about the history of the dollar and that sort of thing. Uh, always, I, I, I think his career influ influences politics. And, and he probably could be described as, as a political architect. <laughs>